Think about the weather in the past few weeks. Um, it's been, one word comes to mind for me at least, and that's flooding. Um, and this is not unique to Houston though. Um, only in the past few years, this is actually a picture of Hurricane Ike when it hit campus a few years ago. And this is Westlot on Rice University's campus where the drain in Westlot really just became a whirlpool. And uh, yeah, so hopefully these low impact developments, hopefully I will persuade you to see how these low impact developments can help with flooding issues, uh, specifically for Houston. So low impact developments are just like the name sounds, uh, they're developments that support um, mitigation of environmental impacts in the landscape. And so I'm going to outline three different low impact developments, bioswales, permeable pavement, and green roofs. And then I'm going to go into an example that kind of uses some of these low impact developments. So what I will be talking about with each low impact development is the practicality in terms of cost and then the environmental benefits in terms of flooding prevention as it applies to Houston. So what is a bioswale? Well, a bioswale is a project that is built into the ground and it has a slope structure so the water on top of the structure can percolate down into the soil. And the reason why, and the, the slope structure also allows for a greater surface area on top of the, on top of the bioswale. And after the bioswale is dug up into the soil, plants and rocks can be uh, planted or placed on the surface so that native species can thrive in the, in the landscape. And at the bottom of the bioswales, there are perforated pipes that connect to the water drainage systems. And so this allows for the water to also percolate in the soil, but also flow down through the, the soil and into the drainage systems of the city. The cost of bioswales really range quite significantly from two for about from about three dollars to about forty two dollars, and this all depends on the on many factors such as soil and plants. So plants, there are many plants that range in price, but in terms of soil, um, it's mo mostly about the labor and time costs. So clay is very densely packed and more so than sand or silt, and so it takes a lot more labor and time to dig up the soil when there are more clay clay-based soils than there are sandy soils. And in Houston specifically, there is a lot of clay soils. And on Rice's campus, in the prairie that is actually, the pocket prairie that is on campus near Weiss, there's a lot of clay soil in that area. And so if there were the addition of bioswales in that area, it may be a little bit more costly than if it was sandy soil. The benefits of bioswales for flood prevention is that they reduce, they can reduce runoff by 88% as opposed to normal landscaping designs like um, the grass that doesn't have very deep roots or just impervious sidewalks. And another benefit is that the water is filtered by the plants so that when the water goes into the drainage pipe, it's actually, it actually has a less of a concentration of contaminants than it would be if it just float, flowed through the soil. Right down the street from Rice, there is a bioswale, there are a few bioswales actually in Mandel Park, and they use these bioswales in terms of their community garden. And so they have planted uh, native plants within the bioswales on the side of the, of the park, and then also have used them to create places for people to come and plant uh, food crops. The next low impact development I'm going to be talking about is permeable pavements. And there are four main types of permeable pavement. The first is porous asphalt. And this is different from regu regular asphalt because instead of having the, the smallest parts of the asphalt, those parts are actually taken out. They're sifted out of the, of the final product. And so there's more areas of pockets for the water to flow through. The second is pervious concrete. And as you can see in the picture, it has a lot more bumps and, and ridges than regular concrete does. But this all results in uh, areas where there are pockets within the concrete for the water to flow through. And these two examples that I just mentioned are 
more used in parking lots and in um, more, uh, I guess, not non-residential areas. The next two actually are used more in residential areas and more for aesthetic purposes. So the first being concrete or brick pervious pavers where there's a lot of space in between the pavers for the water to flow through. And then in open cell pavers, there's actually even more space in between the pavers and um, one can put grass in it or even asphalt or um, other rock materials within those uh, little spaces. In terms of cost, hot mix asphalt is the asphalt that is usually used in parking lots. And so that cost is around $23 to $24. And perme permeable pavement is more costly than <coughs> asphalt, regular asphalt. And it can actually be up to four times more costly. Um, and that is the porous pavers, so the ones that um, look more aesthetically pleasing than the concrete or the porous asphalt. In terms of flood benefits with permeable pavement, the amount of runoff volume um, associated with the types of pavements, um, if you just have asphalt with no bioswales, it can result in 51% of runoff. But if you actually implement uh, permeable pavement with bioswales, it can actually decrease this down to 10% of runoff and this is a pretty significant decrease and 10% is a really great number to shoot for, especially in places like Houston that have a lot of rain. The third and final um, low impact development that I'll be discussing is a green roof. And like its name, it, instead of a regular conventional roof structure, it's actually a layer of vegetation planted on top of a roof. And what's really important about green roofs to have are water drainage systems. So if you just kind of let the water sit on top of the roof, then it's going to um, make the weight of the roof really large and can result in building failures. But if you, but, so you have to really map out where these drainage systems are going to flow. And oftentimes the water can flow off of the roof onto the ground below and water plants in the surrounding vicinity. So it really is kind of like, it can become a cycle in terms of, of developments. And these roofs can either be flat or sloped. At Rice we have a few green roofs at the OEDK and then at Duncan and McMurtry Colleges. Um, at University of Houston, they actually have a sloped green roof, and um, I actually didn't think that this was possible. Like, I, I, I don't know, I guess I was thinking, because um, in terms of maintenance, really, for people to go up there and, and take care of it. Um, but people still actually go up there and can take care of the sloped green roof, and they actually have planted prairie plants on top of that green roof, and that's really important since prairie plants actually have... Um, a, a larger ability to soak up water than normal plants um, that we usually see. In terms of cost, green roofs again are more costly than conventional roof structures. Um, asphalt usually t uh, costs around $120 per 100 square feet and then the most expensive material for roofs is usually metal at about $1,500 per 100 square feet. So green roofs um, range but they are more costly and this also depends on the plants that you want to put on top of the roof just like in bioswales um, what plants you're choosing it all depends on that cost in terms of the benefits of green roofs for flood prevention in the summer one study found that green roofs can soak up to 70 to 90 percent of precipitation and in winter they can soak up 25 to 40 percent precipitation precipitation. And again, this also depends on what types of plants you want to plant. On University of Houston's campus, they're getting a lot of precipitation retention because they have planted those prairie plants. In addition to the flood benefits of LIDs, um, there are additional environmental benefits. For bioswales, they provide habitats for native animals and plants. In permeable pavements, um, they allow for a greater recharge of the groundwater below so that the water can flow down and, and not just remain on the surface. And in terms of green roofs, 
green roofs actually allow for the building to be cooler, and so this reduces energy use in terms of energy uh, in terms of air conditioning in the building. Although these low impact developments have high upfront costs, there are uh, invisible long term costs that are that can be induced without LIDs. So with Houston, with the flooding, with the recent flooding that has been happening, there's going to be a lot of money going into the repairs of buildings and homes and with cars and really in terms of health and in terms of health as well. Many people were injured in these in these floods. Um, with bioswales and green roofs, when there are more native species, this actually decreases maintenance costs because they're more adapted to the landscape. And so non-native grass species require more maintenance and thus more cost. And finally, <coughs> um, green roofs really provide for energy savings. And so without green roofs in especially hot areas and especially in places where there are the heat island effect in cities such as Houston, there can be a lot of um, costs associated with energy waste. So now I'm going to switch uh, switch the topic to talk about a, an example in the Bagby Street reconstruction in Houston. So this street is located in Midtown Houston and it actually includes rain gardens and permeable pavement and rain gardens are kind of smaller scale bioswales. Bio so the, here's a picture of what it looked like before. It was just a, a normal street and on the right side of the before picture, you can see that there is a lot of just normal grass that you might find it on a lawn. In the after picture, we see the permeable pavement um, and also the usage of different, different plants that soak up water within the rain gardens. And we also see an increase of trees. So Bagby, the Bagby reconstruction costs about $9.6 million. And this was within an area of 10 blocks. And that resulted in a cost per square footage of $2,800. Um, and so I actually thought that was a pretty pretty good number. Um, the, the green roofs actually cost like $2,500 per, oh, well, that was per square, per 100 square feet, never mind. So, um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, so. Yeah, but still, I, I still thought that, that, that this was a pretty good price for such a large expanse. Um, and then they have actually found um, the, fl the flood benefits of the Bagby reconstruction too, and that res has resulted in 33% of stormwater runoff captured. The additional environmental benefits associated with the Bagby reconstruction are that 300 tons of carbon dioxide are, are being saved. 13, there's a 13% decrease in the average surface temperatures, and again, this is especially important in Houston with such hot summers and the heat island effect. And then finally, there was a 42% increase in tree growth in the area, and trees soak up carbon dioxide and, and also provide habitats for uh, species. So hopefully we can really to implement these LIDs within Houston and on Rice's campus because we really don't want to see these whirlpools showing up everywhere um, and I don't know this is kind of scary to me <laughs> so <laughs> hopefully we can get that parking lot to be all per permeable pavement with bioswales on the side and I don't know green roof structures with solar panels and I think that would be a really um, great consideration for Rice and Houston. <laughs> With the um, with the bags we high rise, like I've seen like advertisements for like along the song of like protest bag bag. I'm not sure if that's bag we high rise or if that's the same street. Oh, like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I've <laughs> seen those. Though. I've seen those. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's true, that's true. So in like the Mendel Park, are they those uh bio soils used for flood prevention? Yeah. Um, well, I guess yeah. Um, they are used for flood prevention. Um, it's not that large of a park. Um, it's kind of hard to tell in those pictures, but I would say it's about like maybe 
I don't know, eight times the size of this room. Like it's not, it's not huge. So the, it is pretty small scale, but um, any green space in Houston, I think, could benefit from bioswales. And that was just hap that just happened to be like an available green space, and so they really like took advantage of it. But policies are needed on this because the expense is borne by whoever puts this in, but. If I'm understanding right, it's keeping water from going as quickly to the bayous, or it may be your neighbor or someone pretty far downstream who you're protecting from flooding. So how do you align the incentives right or, or mandate? What do you think are the ways to, to get this to happen more, even if that virus rail on your property might not be what present, prevents floods on your own property? Yeah, that's, that's, actually, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I guess... I guess, um, I mean, I think like these, like these punctuated equilibrium events such as these like massive flooding events in Houston could be really great times to bring this up to the community um, and just kind of propose whenever there is a new construction being built that maybe there needs to be an incorporation of flood prevention, low impact developments um, because like so just taking to, into account Houston's climate and its its like need to have these structures for flooding, um, yeah, I think maybe maybe the city could propose whenever there's like a renovation of the parks or 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 other green spaces that um, low impact developments could be in that plan. I'm sure that like that back bay, that the back bay like renovation cost, you know. Uh, yeah, it was nine point six million dollars. Okay. Yeah. That that includes sidewalks and streets and all of that, right? It's, yes. You know, plus the LID features. Yes. That's true. Did you do much um, research of other uh, jurisdictions, other cities, and whether they have particular um, requirements of LID approaches or have set up incentives? Uh, kind, kind of in line with Professor Cohen's question. I don't know if you spent a lot of time looking at case studies or not, so that's, that's where I'm going. Um, I didn't, but yeah, that, that would be really interesting um, because, I, I mean, with this Bagby reconstruction, I was actually surprised to hear that like, like the community and also a lot of like city council members were really for it, so I would be interested to see like what other cities kind of have the, the backing of um, the city behind them. I'm, I'm, if memory serves me right, uh, I think in the Pacific Northwest, both Seattle and Portland have policies that encourage uh, LID, but their rainfall patterns are very different than ours. Um, the, you know, I think one of the interesting things about the Bagby project is, is the fact that it's in, a, uh, it's in a climate that has really extreme rainfall events. So. Um, I guess part of the understanding of the success of that project will be how does it react when we get one of these crazy events like we've had a lot of recently. Yeah. <laughs> I would be, yeah, I'd be interested in looking at how bad B Street fared too. I actually didn't even look into that for this particular event, but you know, it would be interesting to look at that. Or like just pass by it, I guess, to see if it's still there. <laughs> Charlie Penland might be able to tell you. Um, okay. You're, you're a city, right? Yes. Okay, um, and he's, he teaches in the city department, and he was involved in the design of the Bagby Street project. 